So what you're seeing here is a library full of books. And if you think about how library books are classified, they use some sort of system like the Library of Congress system to help you find a book by author, by type, or uh, by subject. And uh, as you can see, similar books can be gr grouped similarly. So that's how a classification system can be useful. The classification system that we will be using in chemistry is the periodic table. And in this very short podcast, we will be studying the early history of the development of the periodic table and the creation of what is known as the periodic law. In 1787, Lavoisier, Antoine Lavoisier, whom you know is famous for things like his law of conservation of matter and famous for losing his head at the guillotine, he categorized elements that were present at the time in various categories, so acid-making elements. Uh, he even treated things like heat and light as if they were elements because they were gas-like elements. They did know about various elements at the time, but the most common ones would have been like the metal, since those were easily refined and had been, been being refined since the Bronze Age. So he had a lot of metallic elements that are common today. He also had a category that he called earthy. And if you notice, these ones are really what we now know to be compounds. And a lot of them compounds of the alkaline earth metals like calcium or hydroxide or magnesium oxide. So Lavoisier has compiled a list of 23 known elements at approximately the late 1700s. In the 1800s, the dramatic changes brought about by the Industrial Revolution allowed us to use things like electricity to break down compounds into their elements, to analyze substances using spectrometers. And so the number of Lavoisier's elements that he had discovered by the late 1700s tripled to about 70. In the late 1800s, chemists began to understand that you could categorize elements based on their relative masses to each other. For example, once again, if you have one mole of any gas in a container, and you have another gas in a container, same size, same shape, same temperature, same pressure, even though they're different gases, experiments were able to prove that each container had the same number of particles. However, each container did not weigh the same. So relatively speaking, one could calculate that carbon was 12 times as heavy as hydrogen atoms. And so thus began the concept of relative atomic masses. So John Newland in 1800, 1864 proposed an organizational scheme that was arranged by lining up the elements through increasing atomic mass. And what he noticed is after about every eighth element or so, the patterns began to repeat in the properties of the elements themselves. He called this the law of the octaves. But of course, as you know, that would not be analogous to musical octaves. So let's take a look at John Newland's chart. This time, he's arranging his columns vertically, and as you go from top to bottom, by the time you get to the eighth element at the top of the next column, this is where he began to see the repetition in patterns. Now, if you look sideways on it, you see the beginnings of our periodic table. For example, here is lithium and sodium, the first two elements in the alkali metals column on our modern periodic table, grouped together in the same row on John Newland's Law of Octaves chart. Well, it took the three M's, Meyer, Mendeleev, and Mosley, to come up with a better version of the periodic table. And both Meyer and Mendeleev demonstrated connections between the mass of an element and its properties. In the history books, Mendeleev gets credit because he published first, and he shows the usefulness of such a chart. He was not only able to categorize existing elements within um, families or groups that had similar properties, he predicted the existence of and properties of undiscovered elements that were in fact discovered many years later and he left blanks for those on his chart. Now, in case you're unclear on the concept, notice that these uh, fill in the blanks for your yellow PowerPoint notes are here in yellow font on your screen. So you should definitely be taking notes as we go along through these podcasts for chapters six and seven. Now, there were some errors in his system. 
Here's a picture of Mendeleev, kind of Rasputin-y looking, long beard, long hair. His family had a glass factory in Siberia, and I guess he had a lot of cold nights on which to think deep thoughts about. So he began to play a game of what we call patience games, or kind of elemental solitaire, and it took him a couple of days of no sleep to lay out the elements in a pattern that began to organize them by their atomic weights, but revealed their similarities as well as their differences. So in class, you will see a very short but cool video about the history of the periodic table and other videos that demonstrate Mendeleev's great breakthroughs. But essentially what he created was something that looks like this. And it's not too far off from the modern periodic table. Remember, of course, if you look at the bottom, he's organized these elements in order of increasing atomic weight. And in doing so, he saw a periodic repetition of properties. This is the first statement of the periodic law, although not completely correct. Across the top here, these are oxides of the various elements. So for example, the R stands for any element in the first column. So for example, water's formula would be H2O. Lithium oxide's formula would be Li2O, and so on. And you notice also that he's left some blanks, as well as these guys right here where it says Eka. Those are where he predicted that elements would appear as they were discovered or be able to be refined. And in fact, he was absolutely correct. So this is the first shot at it in about the early 1800s of Mendeleev's Table of the Elements. It took until the early 1900s, and as you learned in the atom chapter and the electron chapter, we discovered that elements... That was a cat falling in a trash can. <laughs> Good move, Amy. You want to show yourself, Amy? Here's the cat that just caused the disruption. She's leaving. Anyways, Mosley in 1913 um, had taken on um, or used the work that had been dis uh, discovered or revealed by the likes of the Curies or Becquerel, um, Niels Bohr, all of these people that were working in the late 1800s and early 1900s, Rutherford, J.J. Uh, uh, Thompson, that had discovered these subatomic particles. And so he proposed that let's put together a periodic table that's not based upon atomic mass, but by atomic number, which of course you remember is the number of protons in the nucleus. Sadly, the British government thought it was appropriate to take someone of his great intellect and put him out to war in World War I, so unfortunately he was killed in action in 1915. So, Mosley said, when atoms are arranged according to increasing atomic number, the remaining problems that were existent in Mendeleev's periodic table disappeared. And so because of Mosley's work, our modern periodic table is based on the atomic numbers of the elements. Hence, we have the correct version of the periodic law. There is a periodic repetition of the chemical and physical properties of the elements when arranged in order of increasing atomic number. So that brings us up to, there's a lovely shot of Mosley. That brings us up to our modern periodic table. And that will conclude this very short first podcast for chapter six and seven. We will in future sections, not only understand how to label and identify the parts of the periodic table as we know it today, but also be able to describe what we call the periodicity or regularly repeating patterns based upon something we just got done studying, the very important number and kinds of electrons, especially in the outermost valence orbitals. Take care until I see you at podcast number two.